Okay, everybody, let's get ready for our next talk. The C API is surprisingly fun. Let's welcome Tom and Yannick. All right, welcome everyone. Um, so we're here to talk about the uh, C API. Uh, I'm Tom, you might know me as Tom Breck. This is uh, Yannick, you might know him as Yacinder, that's how I pronounce it. And uh, we work at Flox and we've sometimes been playing with the C API that's coming out and we thought we'd just share it with you, tell you what it's all about, uh, maybe motivate you to check it out and uh, kind of what's next and some like overviews for it. So pretty simple uh, and we think it's something you should try. Uh, so the current state, uh, basically last year at NixCon, this was kind of presented as a proposal um, by uh, Yorick and it kind of walked through how someone could use this, the motivations behind it. And uh, since then, this got merged uh, by the team uh, and you could do a few things, right? You can evaluate impression, uh, expressions, you have prim ops, you kind of work with a little bit with the stores and uh, the support for this is getting better and better. Um, it's still not all the way there. It's very much in flux in terms of exactly what the API is, what's exposed, what's not. But we're, we'll just do it, like I said, give you a big uh, overview. Um, so a bunch of people, a bunch of time has gone into it. Um, and let's check it out. So what can we do right now? Uh, so there's some docs that are generated you could take a look at. Um, a lot of it's very, very low level. It kind of, it's a little bit painful. It's a little bit annoying. But you can kind of see uh, bigger things you can build out of it. Um, imagine you could uh, start to have something where uh, the, the initialization that Nix always goes through when you're like running it as a command line could perhaps be skipped or defaulted, or you could start to create language servers, things along those lines. Uh, you can create more intelligent caching. Um, and uh, I don't know what else you can build with it. So the idea is to expose the API, have more and more people use it, and uh, do, do cool things. All right. Uh, just to give, like, a quick overview on like what this API that we have is. Um, so like we have some some sort of context uh, that will be present basically everywhere in most of the functions. Uh, there's initialization of libraries. Um, there's a store layer where which lets you access certain store operations. Um, and yeah, uh, to add on that, there's well expression evaluation and, uh, well, value calling, uh, expression building. Yeah. Um, so context, you'll see it everywhere. Um, it's mostly used to, uh, to expose error messages. So you can extract error messages out of there, check whether, they, whether previous operations uh, caused an error. Um, and it's just floating around basically with, with every operation that you do. Um, okay. Then, yeah, we have like s several somewhat independent components uh, for, well, utilities, which is basically used by all of them. Um, there's a lib store layer, they are uh, an expression layer, and, well, values. Uh, they, the, these are like some basic functions that you usually use to initialize those. Like you initialize the utils, you can initialize the store with or without loading the configuration, which is, um, well, what what Tom said to to substitute your own like static configuration in if you don't want like default Nix handling of it. Okay, so uh, libstore, um, the way this works is uh, this is kind of your avenue to access all the various stores. Nix has a whole bunch of stores implemented which makes uh, for a really good functionality. And for this, uh, you've got um, a function that open one up. So you give it the context, you give it one of these URIs and some parameters, and now you have access to all the stores that Nix has kind of implemented. That's pretty cool. Um, there are a few ones that are like worth noting. Uh, so like the dummy store, this is really good when all you really want to do is like some simple expression evaluation or you want something to be fast. It's all happening in memory. There's no local store required for that. So that's helpful. Uh, if you want to connect to the daemon, uh, something that's local, so local file system, you know, to connect to remote stores like SSH, you got the S3 one. Uh, also be aware there's like the auto store. This kind of does a little bit of logic to kind of find the correct one for the for what you're on. So if you're on like Nix OS or uh, if you're on like a single user install, kind of tries to do the right thing. Um, and with this, uh, you can 
basically go grab a store and open it and then use that handle uh, later on. Yep. So some of the store methods here, uh, basically it's, it's taking that thing and now you could start manipulating it. So, hey, you want to like, you know, parse a path, you could check to see if something is valid or whether or not it exists. Um, the most interesting one or thing that kind of starts to really give you some power here is uh, next store realize. This is where you're going to take something like a uh, derivation and then turn that, you're going to realize it and turn it into something else, um, do some side effects on your store, create other things. So this is kind of the building block underneath build. Um, there are some interesting pieces here. So um, uh, when you when these thing when the realize completes, right? There's a callback here. So you get some user data you can put into the system. You also can kind of get some of that uh, uh, user data back out and do interesting things with the results. So if you want to create some sort of a pipeline, you kind of have all the the, the pieces you need to make it. It makes it a little bit awkward by like passing those callbacks around, but again, it's uh, you know to give you some flexibility. Um, another one is the copy closure, right? You got a source, you got a destination, you can start to move things around between stores, right? Another useful abstraction. Um, there's still, like the store methods are not all complete yet. There's still more work to be done to kind of expose more functions, um, more of like those underlying low level operations. Um, but some of these are kind of enough to start to do um, interesting things. As an example for methods missing, there is no way to add anything to the store. So there's that. Um, yeah, for, for the evaluation part, you have well, this, uh, this evaluation state, which tracks symbols, like lets you evaluate and parse expressions, and well, just connect all of those together to uh, do basic Nix evaluations. Um, they, there is a store parameter that is basically used to uh, to decide where derivations or DRVs are being stored, where, uh, well, basically any eval time store paths are being fetched from and stored to. Um, the lookup path that you see here is also used to uh, inform, well, relative paths in expressions that you might use. Yeah, to put this into practice, we, we've implemented, like, a small thing in both Go and Rust. Uh, to show like how to uh, use these, this store thing, um, to just quickly show how that looks like. Uh, if we, we we have a program that allows you to well um, give an expression that takes whatever expression you put in the command line and then um, well lets you output something of it. Yes, dot missing. Oh no. <laughs> um, whoops. Uh, we didn't see that. Um, anyway, we start with the Go layer, which is more close, closely modeled after the well actual methods that we have exposed from the C layer. So, yeah. Um, so we have to give you a big picture overview. Uh, like our kind of toy example to try to exercise various portions of this is we're going to write a command line tool, right? We always talk about how uh, Nix is uh, JSON with functions. So I figure we'll just read JSON, you know, line by line from standard in, apply a Nix function to it, and output JSON. Simple, right? So uh, some of this is also showing you some of the lower level details. Um, most of this should be hidden away for you in terms of like language specific wrappings. But again, this is to kind of one, motivate people to write more of those wrappings and you know, kind of give you a little idea of what's going on underneath. So for Go, um, basically there's some boilerplate here to get C Go functioning and working. Uh, you gotta point at the right headers. You gotta kind of create some of these callbacks so that they actually work correctly and you have to de declare those. Um, some of this is boilerplate. I just made a call back there to print something out because, well, we like to print values. Um, but you could do other things if you want to. All right, so the first thing we gotta do is we gotta initialize all our, our, all our uh, libraries. This is pretty simple, just, hey, you know, create the context, you know, initialize this library, that library. If it fails, then, you know, yell and tell the user or give someone a better error message. Uh, obviously, you don't wanna, like, just panic here. You could probably give someone better error messages out of that context. That's what Yannick was talking about, is that inside that context, when there's an error, you'll have some better description other than just, er, we can't. So, um, but that's the initialization portion, usually not a, not a problem. 
Uh, so here's like, we talked about the stores. Um, for this example, um, we just opened like a dummy store, but you could imagine opening an actual store and do something real. Let's say not just uh, applying a Nix function onto a bunch of uh, JSON. What if you, I don't know, built a bunch of things you know, per line, or what if you fetched them or pushed them to another store, did some other you know, more complicated store-to-store -store processing. You could imagine using not a dummy store, but a real one. But yeah, so we open one. Hey, if I can't open it because it doesn't open, then you know, yell at the user again. Okay, so once we got the store created, we got the state created, um, I do a little bit of uh, work here just to grab the current working directory. Again, some of the, uh, some of the API expects that current working directory. If you were like in your expression, refer to a relative path, well, relative to what? what? Current working directory. We got to convert it into a C string because right, we're in Go, we're trying to use the C API. Again, most of this stuff should be hidden uh, once you're using like proper bindings that wrap all this functionality. But again, we're showing you the nuts and bolts. Okay, so let's actually get started, do something hopefully useful. A lot of this is set up. Um, it's a lot of like pushing things around, trying to use that like core thing. So here, what are we gonna do? Um, we're gonna allocate a value, start at the very top. We're gonna allocate some value and we're gonna put into it um, an evaluated expression that we're gonna pull out right from just the command line. And that's gonna hopefully be a function that someone could then apply to all the data that's streaming through. So that's what that uh, Nix expert eval from string does. Right, it takes that user input and turns it into a function ready to apply, ready to use on things. Um, this is not quite obviously the best way of doing this, but just to kind of showcase what, how this works, we also made similar sorts of functions for the uh, built-ins. So from JSON and to JSON, um, you can kind of see the pattern there of, hey, just take something that you would normally write as like a Nix expression, and we're turning it into now a, uh, a value that we can apply, but like, more manually than you normally would do if you're just you know, writing Nix stuff. But now I have everything I need. I have my user function, I have a way to turn it from JSON and turn it back into JSON. All right, now we can start the fun stuff, which is, uh, this is just kind of go standard boilerplate of, hey, go read line by line everything that you wanna read. Great, for each line we're gonna allocate a value, read that line in, and then we're gonna initialize a string because um, that's what the person input. And now we're going to, uh, uh, take that JSON and uh, you know have it all be ready. So this kind of is all just the allocations, getting anything kind of ready to, to be run. And some of these are uh, intermediate values we'll need along the way. So if you create a value um, or allocate one, then you need one to you need a place to put those things. And then now that we have those values ready to go, now we're going to call our functions one by one. Again, you could probably merge these into one, but for demonstration purposes, right? What do we do? We take the line of JSON someone uh, gave the program. We're going to say, hey, from JSON this thing. You know, translate this, parse it, turn it from JSON, turn it into like a Nix value. Next item, we're gonna call another function. This is the user function, the one the user gave us. We're gonna now apply you know, all those fun things we might wanna do. Um, I don't know what, come up with some, uh, some nice things there. When you're done, then we say, okay, we're gonna now output JSON again. So our last function is to call to JSON, right? Output this thing so something that can be printed. We force that value. Um, you could have, you could try to kind of uh, manage when things are going to be forced as well with this API a little bit more, more fine tuned than you uh, might otherwise if you're just using Nix itself. And then lastly, when we're done, um, we want to get that result and actually print it out. So you could see here we use the Nix get string. Um, we use that callback mechanism um, that we mentioned before to basically say, hey, go take that uh, the result from having all those, done all those calls pass it to some function that for us just prints it out. And that's pretty much it. Like we just kind of really quickly walked through the whole sequence of, hey, you know, read some input from a user, convert it into like the, the C values that are necessary to use the API, um, turn it from JSON into something that Nix understands, then turn, you know, transform it with some function, turn it back to a JSON, and then output the result. Pretty simple, but it kind of walks us through the various steps of the, of the process. All right, so what do we see in the Go implementation just now is that at this low level, there's a lot of repetition. You have, uh, whenever you do anything with values, you have to allocate the value first, then you have to read into the value. If you apply some, some expression, you, uh, you first have to, well, allocate the value, read an expression into the value, call the, like, allocate another value for the result, another value for, for 
parameters, then call the, the expressions, load everything into the, the right values. It's a bit of boilerplate that every call uh, like comes with. So usually you would want to like create some wrappers around this to make this a bit more convenient to use. Um, in this case, like we've we've used Rust or like the Rust bindgen create to get like these low-level functions and wrote a little library around those. Um, so for example, for the context, instead of like dealing with just the context pointer, uh, we wrap the the context in some new struct. Uh, we create a pointer, and we see here in Rust, Rust also makes it like very obvious that lots of this stuff is kind of unsafe because you're like dealing with pointers and stuff. Um, so we are creating a context, we're initializing the utility library, um, then we, in this case, we check for errors. So there's an abstraction for, well, checking for errors because also error checking um, needs to be done manually now. Um, and this check error message just checks the context if there's an error in there, if there's an error, like, throws a, a Rust error um, and otherwise continues. Yeah, and then you continue or you access the the other function is to accessing the pointers. And there's equivalent or very similar methods for like those other structs here as well. Um, then for values, values have a bit more going on because you can, well, pass expressions and call them. In this case, this is the uh, expression parsing. So here you, well, you take a context, you take an, uh, an evaluated state, uh, and an expression that can just be a, a Rust string. So from the outside, it just looks like a, an ordinary Rust function. Uh, and then here again, you allocate the value. We saw that before, like, more uh, explicit. Uh, we check the errors again. We create C strings and call another C, binded, uh, C bound function, like do another bit of error checking. This is all stuff that you would want that you would do like manually in the in the Go implementation that we saw, and here it's uh, all contained in this expr uh, method of the uh, of the value implementation. So to get an expression, you just well call this function, give it a give it an expression, and hopefully get a get an okay with a uh, passed value. Um, same for the call part. So again, we allocate a value, check errors, well, call the value. Again, we pass a lot of pointers here, but that's fine, I guess. Um, and then, well, check errors and return the values. Uh, so to bring it all together, um, again, we're creating context, store, state. Uh, we pass some expressions, so like the argument that a user Defined the built-ins, built-in from JSON, built-in to JSON, um, and then already run through the lines. And it's yeah, we again parse some uh, pass some line input, just create a value out of this. Uh, we deserialize by just calling the the from JSON function that we that we have, transforming that function, serializing again, and printing it out. Uh, the Two string implementation sadly didn't fit like on this slide, but well. Uh, so yeah, that's in my opinion a little bit cleaner than just like having to to allocate every single value, which indeed does give you some uh, some ability to I don't know reuse memory if that's if that's your deal. But uh, from a user's perspective, like wrappers around these these low level things make it uh, much more easy to use. Um, Python, no Python. Um, so yeah, this, this is a slide about like what implementations there are. So we have, we put ours, no, it is not ours. Anyway, um, there's, whoops, there's Rust implementations, like at least two of them that we've seen. Uh, there's a Go implementation of this, uh, like for, for such like wrappers. Nim and Zig and probably others as well uh, that already use this and expose uh, some quality of libraries around this. Python. Yeah. So the the idea is that we already have some of these wrappers that start to make this more ergonomic and useful. Um, the point of this is just to kind of let everyone of these things exist, but also to ask you, well, help 
kind of make those wrappers and help kind of start using this in new places and create tools and create things that otherwise uh, would be either more annoying or harder to get to. So uh, please like you know, make that ecosystem richer. Um, there's still some things to do, right? So there's still milestones, there's still issues. Uh, there's some links to that in the slide about like, you know, what's next to implement. Uh, we need help also on like just the implementation side to expose more portions of the API that currently aren't exposed. Uh, big thanks to uh, Robert and Yorick, who's kind of you know ran a lot of these things and uh, pushed them along, make them happen. I know uh, John Erickson's working on that as well. Um, a lot of this is kind of in flux, so you kind of need to be trying to use like the the latest version. Um, you know, using things off of like the latest and master and so forth makes things easier easier to use. Uh, you can access them by uh, each individual library, also one by one, so you can build them individually. These are all kind of pieces that like the, the team's been trying to like put together. Um, some things we're looking for would be like more store actions. Uh, I wanna be able to create and write the plugins in this ecosystem as well. So that way I don't have to kind of do, tie together three different pieces, maybe only two pieces, but that's a thing we, we wanna be able to uh, utilize. Um, we ran into some issues with uh, Clang, um, trying to use Clang and Go and C, sometimes it gets confused. So we have to kind of just convince it, hey, use GCC instead. Um, we always need more docs, right? This is like the ever-present call. More docs, anyone who likes writing docs, another thing they can kind of uh, sink their teeth into. Um, we still need to add uh, a similar sort of C API for like, for Nix Flakes. That's another thing that kind of would be nice to add to it and be able to start manipulate all these things, um, you know, programmatically. So yeah, uh, make fun things and uh, give it a shot, use it, let's fix it. That's, that's the call. All right, thank you. Do we have any questions? Do you see any? Questions are hiding. Well, we got a lot of time. <laughs> but uh, we, we, we don't need any questions. If OK. Oh, yeah, there we go. OK. Go ahead. We have a winner. I'm not sure if it makes sense, but is it possible, let's say if you wrote like your own evaluator, like interpreter for Nix, to how would you use built-ins, right? Like uh, let's say I want to imp delegate the built-ins, like store all those functions like derivation and so on to your C API. Um, how would that be? Is that possible or, or is that a to-do still? So you can use the Nix evaluation. I don't think you can bring your, your entire own evaluation implementation. But what you can do, you can provide and define primops, so other built-ins, I guess, um, that, well, that you then, where you then get the value that is applied to it and then, uh, well, do something with it out of band and, and put it back in, um, which I don't know, may just call like a different evaluation thing, like a different language or whatever, like, like I guess you are, you're pretty free to put in there like whatever you want. Um, but you have to define it before like running this and within your, uh, within your thing. What doesn't work again is like creating plugins to write a plugin in whatever language you choose with a C, C API and then have Nix Nix actually use that. Um, unfortunately, these seem to depend on uh, well, being written in C++ and running like C static initializers and uh, C++ initializers. So. Yeah, um, another, another piece here that kind of talks about is uh, like one use case here would be where a single evaluation can't really be done for some reason because you have to kind of do, go do other operations after you've learned something. So if you need to go like run an eval and then go use your like general purpose programming language to go do other things, I don't know, contact APIs or read disk stuff or contact the user, or do other things, and then jump back into evaluation, right? That could be made much more performant, much more integrated uh, with something like this. So it's kind of eval plus plus. Aha, uh -huh. there come the questions. Just need some time to think of. 
Uh, thanks a lot. Super interesting. Um, um, just out of interest, uh, is, is the Z API thread safe? Like um, um, uh, with your Go example, um, um, the thing that you demoed, could I run it in parallel in multiple um, Go routines? Um, or is there something like a global interpreter lock like the Python Z API has? For the, so I think you could only get the initialization once, but actually, Ilko, you might know better than me. Is the evaluator, yeah, the, I don't, the evaluator is not, absolutely not, but I, what, I'm, what I don't know is whether or not you can initialize more than one of these at once and have them kind of be independent. So I, I could run multiple evaluations um, at the same time. But they would have to be s completely separate evaluations, yeah. working yeah. on like separate instantiations of like the store and the state and all that. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, there is some work to allow for like multi-threaded eval, but that's a whole nother topic that Ilko's been working on. Thanks. And I don't know if that's exposed or even planned to be. I'm curious how you all are using this at Flux currently, if at all. Uh, at the moment, we're not. Um, we, uh, we've uh, written a bunch of things where we kind of we need to do this sort of work, where we want to run some evaluations, do something smart with the result, and then go do more evaluation. So we're keeping an eye on this. We're looking at it. We're, we're evaluating whether we want to use it. And this might be a better way than kind of shelling out to calling Nix a whole bunch of times. Um, that way we can skip a bunch of like the initialization things, a lot of like the shell annoyances, um, you know, process annoyances. And this might just be more performant. Yeah, it's also like the, like there's at least three alternatives to get Nix functionality, right? Like you can either call the CLI, you can use the C uh, interface, or you use the internal C++ libraries. Um, the benefit of more well um, fully fledged C libraries would be that the C libraries are intended to be more stable, where while the C++ interfaces are rather internal and do change between releases of Nix. So if you do builds on top of C++ libraries, you you are bound to like refactoring and like keeping up with Nix. Right? Uh, well, hello and thank you. Um, I, I was wondering because you mentioned that you are planning to do store interactions. Is um, and I'm not sure how it really it is implemented, but builders like uh, Nix remote builders, do you plan on doing bindings that can, for example, allow uh, that would allow to uh, um, copy a derivation recipe to a remote builder and uh, and make it build something and get the output through uh, the C API? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I know that you, and I mean, you should be able to, I, did, I have not tested it, but I know you should be able to use to build against a remote store, but that's different than using the remote builder API. So yes. uh, that's not exposed yet, I, and, I, and I, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would love it though, and I would love that PR. Because when can the, we expect that? Yeah, because <laughs> um, I think that with store, uh, you have multiple uh, URI uh, protocol supported, but with builders, there is SSH and SSHNG. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think it can be quite uh, hard to uh, address this uh, or to allow these capabilities uh, with uh, the C API. But well, I, I don't know much more. I am fascinated, and I would love to see that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's thank our speakers again. Thank you.